Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Wolfi, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm thrilled to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership superlative guitarist, singer, composer, and producer Stevie Salas. A prominent solo artist in his own right, he has recorded on more than 70 albums with a diverse range of artists spanning George Clinton, Bootsy Collins, Bernard Fowler, Buddy Miles, Doug Wimbish, and Jara, uh, Jara Harris, to Justin Timberlake, T.I., Mick Jagger, Rod Stewart, and Zach Wilde. Salas has further distinguished himself by branching out into television, film, as an author, and more. Those undertakings include working on the American Idol show, his book about touring with Rod Stewart called When We Were Boys, and exec producing the award-winning documentary Rumble, The Indians Who Rocked the World. So expansive is his career, we could devote multiple episodes of this show to do it justice. But this go-around, we're going to focus on his experiences and contributions to the world of funk rock. Stevie, how are you? So, so glad you could join us. Good to see you again, man. Nice to be here. Outstanding. And where is here right now for you? Um, I moved to Austin, Texas about nine years ago, nine, ten years ago. I got really sick of California and I, I had a place in LA and a place in, on the beach in San Diego and I just got rid of everything, packed up, moved to Canada where I work a lot and, um, on film and then in indigenous, uh, I work with a company in uh, six nations in Na Indian reservation in Canada and doing a lot of, a lot of stuff creating uh, charity work, uh, putting water filtration systems in places, uh, stuff I do on the side that I'm really into. And um, then then my son was starting school, and and so we moved to Austin, Texas, right around the corner from uh, my old buddy Charlie Sexton, who's my neighbor. And uh, our kids went to go to the Waldorf school. Well, Charlie's is out now, but my son goes to the Waldorf school here in Austin. Outstanding. Well, thank you for making the time to do this. I much appreciate it. been a fan for so long, and, uh, you know, we've kind of uh, – moved in some of the same orbit at times, but not really connected like this. So it's so cool to finally do it. Cool. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. And, uh, you know, we kind of come from a similar background. We were talking in terms of our musical sensibilities. So uh, that's fantastic. And I wanted to start out talking about how you were first drawn to music and why the guitar specifically, though. You know, originally I was, I was a drummer. 
And, and that's why probably if you ever really look at the history of my career, I've played with probably the greatest, some of the greatest drummers in the history of rock and roll. Um, and I'm also known by this, a lot of those drummers as a real asshole. Um, but at the end, they all love me. Like on the back of my book, I discovered Taylor Hawkins, let's say, from the Foo Fighters. Well, I found him in a bar and I took him around the world with me on a world tour. And, and, uh, and he, I saw him in a British magazine recently talking about how I really drove him, but he needed to learn these things, and those are the tools he uses now. And so I started as a drummer because to me, drums were everything. The beats were everything in high school. And um, but then I thought about I thought about it like, do I want to really like? And when you're in high school and you got a band and I'm the drummer, then you got to have a truck. So then if you got the truck, then everyone puts their gear in your car, and then you're the first one to get there and the last one to leave, and then you're in the back. I got forget it. So uh, I started messing around on the guitar. And for me, luckily, the guitar was super easy for me. I don't know what it was. I just, it just worked for me quickly and started playing when I was 15. And by the time I was 17, I was, my band was probably one of the most popular bands in, in Oceanside and San Diego, North San Diego County. And I was playing high school dances and big, big giant events. And, and I just stayed with the guitar and then sort of what worked, but drums was my, drums was my thing. And what about your early influences? You know, who were some of your heroes and what styles of music? Well, you know, I, like you, um, I grew up loving black music and rock music equally. Um, and I, I grew up in a, in a place called Oceanside, California, where there was a Marine Corps base next door. So I lived, I grew up on the beach skateboarding and surfing. And, um, you know, I remember being in a skateboard contest at the Oceanside Pier in sixth grade, and that's the first time I ever heard somebody somebody skateboarded to the song "Hey Baby" by Ted Nugent, and it's like bam, bam, and the guy was like all funky, right? It was like dope, you know. Now those, you know, Derek St. Holmes who wrote the song is my my boy. I love him, and uh, but back then I was sixth grade. I was like, this is the dopest song I've ever heard. Who is this? And uh, so I instantly was caught up in that mix of rhythm. Because skateboarding and surfing, man, we could listen to black music and rock music, and it wasn't weird. Like, and, I, and, you know, I was on the wrestling team in high school and played football and baseball, and all my black friends would turn me on to Funkadelic, and I was into Kiss and Zeppelin, right? And so they go, well, these guys are like the Kiss of, um, of black music. And I go, Funkadelic and Bootsy Collins? Little did I know, you know, I have a couple years out of high school, those guys were going to change my life. But um, I was aware of them, and, I, and so I had a real balance of that stuff. I could easily listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire, and, I could, and then I could turn on and put on a, a Ted Nugent song. Or, and I hate Ted Nugent now just because he's such an idiot. But um, I, I, I could easily put on a Zeppelin song or an Aerosmith song. Aerosmith, song, Aerosmith spoke to me, Toys in the Attic and Rocks. Those records spoke to me in such a heavy way. And ironically, I don't know, a few years ago, and I've been working on and off friends with Stephen Tyler for a long time one night at a, some football stadium in Central America, and I went backstage to say hi. And Steven Tyler's like, you want to come up and play uh, Last Child with us tonight? And I'm like, yeah, I know that one. Because, I mean, I used to sit in my bedroom at my mom and dad's house just playing that record over and over. Da -da -bam 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 -bam. So I, I go, I know that one. So, you know, I got on stage with Aerosmith and played Last Child. So for me, it was like, somebody shoot me, right? Wow. You know, I grew up in Santa Monica. Uh, so a little bit similar and uh, same, very similar experience, Stevie. And well, Southern, I'll tell you, we have to cut you off, but in Southern California, I, I don't know for you, but for me, you didn't see color. I didn't see, I didn't think I was different than anybody else. I didn't notice really black guys being different than white guys. I mean, you just didn't see color in Southern California. It was like all acceptable to me. And it wasn't until later when I started traveling around the country that I realized, whoa, there's some weird shit going on. Well, also, we had a very... Um, we had an integrated school, so that helped. But um, yeah. I remember, though, first I was into funk. Then I got into, like, Rocks and Aerosmith and, and ACDC. And, so, and, and I remember saying, I don't know why. You know, I love funk, but I like these, too. And then somebody said, well, it's because those are funky. Boom. I mean, come on, John Bonham's about as funky as they get, you know. You listen to those records, man. It's like those. That's how many. Well, let's just tell you when hip hop started in the late '80s. I was one of the first guys in LA doing hip hop records because I was really into Eddie Martinez and what he was doing with Run DMC and Rick Rubin, and uh, and I was a staff producer for David Kirshenbaum, 
who was a huge producer, but he knew nothing about hip hop and, and they called it rap music then, right? And he goes, so he, he asked, I, he asked me, do you know anything about rap music? And I go, yeah, you know, my friend David Friendly taught me how to sample, uh, sample uh, hits of ACDC uh, on a cassette, because you sampled on a cassette, and it would just go bam, 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 you know, and it was like super funky just doing that. And so if you think about early origins of hip hop, they were sampling hard rock records, really. I yeah, mean, Rick, all those. Yeah, Rick James Rubin. Yeah. With hard rock hits on Absolutely. What about in terms of actual uh, guitar heroes, though? I mean, are they the usual suspects like Eddie Van Halen and, and people like that, or who else? And Hendrix, which I... You know, I loved Hendrix, but it was more like Hendrix was systemic in me. It was sort of like you didn't even... Have, you, you took him off your list because it was that was just part of your DNA, right? So I really got into... I was really, of course, into, into, into Jimmy Page... And I was really, really into uh, Joe Perry and Brad Whitford. And I was really, really into um, Pat Thrall and Pat Travers. I really liked them. I used to go see them. They get a little boring for me, but when they did that live album with Pat Thrall, uh, Pat Thrall really brought that juice in with Pat Travers, man. And it was like, you know, if you could get past all that crazy time, time signature shit and all that stuff, it was badass what they were doing to me. Uh, and then Ed, when Edward came out, that was the funkiest shit I ever heard. You know what I mean? I was like, he was, he, people never, people talk about Eddie's fingers and tapping and all this shit. I talk about Eddie's right hand, man. It's about, like, and the reason that they were huge is because all the strippers and the chicks could dance to it, right? So it was, Eddie was super funky. And I would find out years later, because I mean, I don't know if you know this, but I might be one of the only guys in the world. I was asked to play guitar. David Lee Roth called me. Um, and I didn't do it. And Sammy Hagar called me and I didn't do it. I actually went to Sammy's, who I love very much, and stayed at his house and wrote songs with him right three days after he left Van Halen. Um, so I'm, I'm a Van Halen guy. Um, and, and But what I used to hear stories about they would play backyard parties and they were playing like, you know, Ohio Players and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and songs by all these funk songs and backyard parties, but with Eddie's heavy tone. So I thought that became the concept, which was... Stevie Solis, the artist who moved when I moved to LA, that was going to be my thing. And it's like you said, that's why I also was so into uh, that Run DMC stuff. That was the stuff in the early to mid '80s that was really starting to fuse the the heavy rock guitar and the hip hop or or funk rhythm, you know. And uh, and I felt like you were part of that. You came right in there, you know, and. Uh, Let's talk about how you got that first uh, first job with George Clinton. George Clinton. Um, George Clinton saved my life. I mean, I don't know if anybody in the world would know me if it wasn't for a few of these God lucky breaks, God given lucky, just right place. You know, sometimes I tell people, when, you know, the worst time in my life could have been August of 1985 because I moved to LA in January of 85 and I left my band, This Kids, in San Diego. And I moved to Atlanta and said, I'm going to try to make it. And I wasn't going home. I wasn't going home. I still had my bedroom at my mom and dad's house, ironically, with all my, you know, my Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and Carmine Rojas and Bowie posters on my wall, you know, not knowing that all these people were going to become super important in my life very shortly, which is really crazy if you think about it. But um, I went to L.A. And, and by 19, by August, I was homeless. I was living in a house where this girl was kind of a junkie. And I lived in the closet. And uh, we got kicked out of the house. And I had nowhere to go. But I had met a guy in a band called the Plimsolls named David Pahoa. They called him David O. And he worked with, with a guy called Rick Parada who would go on to invent matchless guitar amps. But he owned a studio called Baby O Studios, which was this hip studio in L.A. And I used to get to hang out there. And when they found out I was homeless, they told me I could stay and sleep on the couch. And in, in turn, I used to sweep up and clean up and run their rehearsal studio and vacuum and whatever I could do, right? And, and at night, I'd go into whatever room was empty, I'd go on a couch, and I'd go to sleep. It was horrible. You know, imagine every year of my life, I grew up on the beach in Oceanside in Carlsbad, California. August, every day I'm surfing. I'm around beautiful girls in bikinis. And now I'm homeless in Hollywood, sleeping on a couch. And it was the worst August of my life. It was hot, I remember. And it was, you know, I was, I was, but I wasn't going to quit. And I used to go up to every musician. I remember going up to Gene Simmons. He's like... Hey, I play. I say, hey, I play guitar. If you ever need anybody to play some guitar, you know, and he'd be like, 
fuck off. You know, it's like, and I'd be like, okay, I don't give a shit. I had such thick skin. I just didn't give a shit. I did nothing. It just blew past me. And I did that to everybody. And I did it to um, George Clinton one night. I said, hey, you know, I'm Stevie Solace. I play the guitar. And George was looked at me and he was with David Spradley. And they, they had just had a huge hit with Atomic Dog. And he looked at me and they were like, okay. That's all he said. <laughs> and so that night, I don't know, it was about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, they had a guitar player in the studio. God rest his soul. He just died this year. Uh, Jack Sherman, who was then in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And he was in the studio working with them. And I went to sleep in studio, you know, they went to studio A, I went to sleep in studio B couch. And David Spradley came in and woke me up and said, hey. And I'm like, oh, and he's like, you think you might want to come down and try some guitars on this track we're working on? And I'm like, yeah. You know, and I ran out there and, I, and the band Keel was in the studio working during the days. And they had all these amps. That's what Gene Simmons was producing. them, And they had all these amps taped up with yellow tape. Do not touch. And so me and George Clinton said, fuck it. We just took my Marshall and we plugged it into all their shit. And Jack Sherman was still there, so it was a little uncomfortable. And I just went bananas. And back then, uh, the Wang Bar was a new thing. Like, you know, everybody was like the locking thing. And I knew how to do dive bombs really good. And to, to a lot of people in LA, that was like, wow, you know? So I was playing this funk, like, bam, 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 bam. I was going fucking bonkers, knowing George Clinton is so outside. He, George went crazy. George was dancing next to me. And I remember his, he had this, these braids, all these colored braids, and they were slapping me and hitting me while it was dancing. And he stunk like B.O. And, and, and I was just playing. And the songs back then would be 10 or 15 minutes long. You'd put one roll of tape and it'd be a whole song, which just grew forever. Later, they'd edit it out, right? And so my arm was just dying. I was catching, catching, catching. And then George would go, play some blues. Play some fun. You know, and... And next thing I know, it was really uncomfortable. Jack Sherman, who I thought was playing some pretty amazing shit, was asked to leave. And I stayed. And I, could, and I worked on the rest of the record. And I figured out years later, Jack Sherman was a huge fan of Funkadelic. And he knew exactly the kind of shit. He learned what they did growing up. And so when he went into the studio with George on the solo album, it was R&B Skeletons in the Closet. He was giving them that Funkadelic, and he was doing it good, too. I think he was doing it great. But they'd already done that. And so I didn't know them, the music, that deeply. So I gave them whatever I was in my mind. And that was new for George, and that's why George kept me. And that day changed my life forever. I got my first paycheck from Capitol Records for $212 for the session. There you go. There it is. That's a record that changed my life. Yeah. And so... Uh, and next thing you know, Gary Shider started coming over. Gary Shider used to always have this like, sailor's hat on. You know, on stage he wears a diaper, right? But in the studio, he's cool as shit. And they always have a sailor hat on sideways, like with a gangster lean. He'd come over and he'd look at me, smile at me all the time. He looked like a, I used to call me, he looked like a Chester cat. Like from Alice in Wonderland, he had that big old grin. He would look at me. And he like took me under his wing, Shider did. And, and then Bootsy showed up one week. And... Uh, and it was like Bootsy's here. It was like Bootsy calls. I remember the Chili Peppers were coming in and they were playing as demos. And I got to sit there and listen because they thought I was part of Funkadelic. But I was nobody, man. I mean, I was still homeless. But um, Bootsy, Bootsy took me under his wing. He said to me, he goes, you remind me of me when I was a little kid. And I met James Brown. He goes, I'm going to He goes, I'm gonna teach you some shit. So he gave me a Lindrum machine and Bootsy would start coming up. And then by then I moved out into... You know the singer Nika Costa? Yeah. Amazing singer. Mm -hmm. Well, Nika was a kid in high school, and her mom uh, knew me, met me at the studio, Baby O, and she let me move into their guest house. So I used to pick up Nika from high school and drive her around and her and her friends. And I remember her, her best friend was Flip Wilson's daughter. And I moved into this guest house in Beverly Hills. It was rocking, right? I had nothing. It was like the gods were, that were on my side. And so Bootsy used to come over, and he taught me how to program – and 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 that led to everything because everybody thought I was George Clinton's guitar player. So every I would say to people, I'm double scale. And they're like, of course, you're George Clinton's guitar player. But I never did shit. Never did nothing. And so I would. I remember I did this Bernadette Peters from Slap. What was that band she had? Uh, me too. At Climax. She hired me, and all these people hired me. Bernadette Cooper. Bernadette Cooper. Yeah, sorry. And all these people hired me thinking I was somebody from Detroit. 
And really, I was just a surfer kid from Oceanside, California, who never did shit. So I bluffed and it worked. And uh, that led to me meeting Don Was through Bootsy Collins. Wow, what a chain of events, man. Your life just did a 180 right there. It was the craziest from 85, August of 85 to, to by August of 87, I already had a number one record with Was Not Was. So, I mean, it was a crazy two years. Now two years goes by like this, it feels like. Back then, it felt like it was an eternity. I'm just like, every day, it was like, what am I going to do today? How am I going to eat? You know, I had this goal that if I could make $1,000 a month, I could live pretty good. And it's crazy to think you could, you know, in the late 80s in L.A., on $1,000 a month, I lived pretty good. You know, now you got to make $1,000 an hour or you're fucking broke, right? It's like fucking nuts out there. I feel yeah. bad for young people. But, um, yeah, it was a weird two years. It was crazy. And, George, I mean, you had a history of just doing whatever, you know, um, like get off your ass and jam from back in the 70s with that crazy guitar solo, supposedly, rumor has it, which is some guy that was hanging around, some white guy who he paid like 50 bucks to lay down that killer solo. Could have been. I'll tell you a story. Uh, years later, um, Bill Laswell put a band together, um, called me up one day. I was actually up working with the great Jeff Healy, the blind guitar player from Canada. I was up at his house writing songs with him in Canada. And I get a call from Bill Laswell wants to be he, is looking for you. So I called Bill Laswell and he goes, hey, man, uh, I want, let's do this record. I want you to I'm going to put a band again. I want you to do this band. Um, I go, what is it? And he goes, we do it for Rico Disc and it's going to be cool. It's going to be you. Buddy Miles and Bootsy Collins. I'm like, huh? I mean, I was like 23 years old. Yeah, there you go. Hardware. Maybe I was 24. I don't know. And uh, and uh, maybe I was 25, actually. Maybe that. And so he goes, I'm like, Buddy Miles, is he still alive? And he goes, yeah. I go, can he play anymore? He goes, I don't know, but it'll be comedy either way. Let's do it. And I'm like, ah. I was scared to death. I didn't want to do it. I was like, I don't think I could do this. I was I, I was, you know, it was intimidating. Bootsy on bass, Buddy Miles from Band of Gypsies on drums. I was like, I, I don't think I, I'm gonna. I'm walking into a shitstorm. I'm just gonna be a, a target for everybody to tell me how much I suck. And I called Bootsy Collins, and he goes, "Are you crazy, man?" He goes, "You have got to do this." He goes, "You know what it's gonna be like? Some little kid like you playing with me and Buddy. Are you crazy? You got to do this." And I said, "Okay." You know, and he had my back the whole time. And so we, you know, we flew to New York and and, and the odyssey continued of madness in my life. What, what was it like laying it down with those two guys? Well, me, me, and I was, by this point, I'd already put out the album Color Code. I'd already had a huge recording contract. Um, I already had hits as a producer. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure I did was the biggest movie in the fucking world at the time. And so I was pretty hot. Um, and I'd already did Rod Stewart. I was already Rod Stewart in stadiums with Rod Stewart. So by the time we went to the studio to do this album, it was 1991, maybe, 92. So, I mean, in 85 to 92, it was seven years of fucking madness, right? I toured the world with the color code, uh, Rod Stewart stadiums, Bill and Ted's number one, Was Not Was number one. Um, you know, I did Bootsy, what's Bootsy doing? I did all these crazy fucking things, right? And uh, that one's here too. You got that was my that's the shit right there. That, I'll tell you about that record, that was the bomb. But uh, so I go to New York to do this record, and I was prepared. I, I was a songwriter, I'd written a lot of, I'd already had a lot of songs recorded by other artists. I was, I was, I was then published by. Island Music. I might have already switched over to Polygram Music at that point, but I don't remember. But I had a, always had a big publishing deal, and um, I'd write and produce bands, right? And um, so I was really prepared. I came with all these songs, and as soon as I sat down in the studio with Buddy and Bootsy, we set up live in this giant warehouse in, in Greenpoint, Bill Laswell's studio, and it was bitching. It was a giant open room where he had this giant Neve mixing board, and there was no walls. Everybody was in the same room, like we were jamming. Even the engineers had headphones on with this huge mixing board and a two-inch machine. and It was a really incredible way to play. We were all with amps and all the shit. It wasn't all isolated and uptight. And uh, I'd say, I got the song. It was like this. And it was like, none of it was working. None of it was working. So then I, had, I go, okay, I got this one groove. 
um, called I Got a Feeling. It goes, band and band and da da da. Band and band and And Buddy just goes, plop, plop, Bootsy came in. And I go, here it is. This is our sound. This is going to work. It was the first thing we did. Uh, and and then I go into that whole band of gypsies thing at the end, purely for Buddy. Because most people, you knew who the band of gypsies was. But I'm telling you, in 1991 and 92, a lot of cats didn't remember the band of gypsies either. The old school guys knew band of gypsies. But that record hadn't come back around yet. People weren't talking about Machine Gun. Because, you know, it was a, a hundred hours long. Of, so nobody was playing that on the radio. Everybody was into the standard Hendrix stuff. But the band of gypsies were not that known unless you were going up and hanging out with Doug Wimbish or Will Calhoun or those cats would know, right? You know, but regular people weren't done it. So when I went in a band, I was going, but I was, I was ready for Buddy to play Machine Gun, really, is what I was trying to do. Buddy came in and, ooh, and Buddy's back there singing. I remember his, Bill Laswell made this drawing because he would sit behind the drums and his pants were falling down off his ass and you could see his whole butt crack and Laswell would sit back there sketch pad and it, it was like a crazy fucking crazy shit. I remember the phone ringing and Bill Laswell talking to somebody. He goes, oh, the band Soundgarden wants me to produce their album Super Unknown. He goes, I don't want to do it because they won't let me mix it with my own guy. Clank, you know. Cra <laughs> it was a crazy time. It was a crazy time to be around music. And so we did Got a Feeling. And I remember this was the crazy shit when you talk about Funkadelic and strange people playing on tracks. Bill Laswell wanted us to record the song Good to, Good to Your Ear Hole. Um, I don't know which Funkadelic record's on. I can't remember. One of my favorites, um, yeah. Yeah, I, and I ended up recording it later on with Mudbone singing it on my album Electric Pow Wow. But that's the first time I really heard Good to Your Ear Hole. It's from Let's Take It to the Stage. Yeah, okay. So, so Laswell goes, we should maybe think about cutting this song. And he puts it on, and me and Bootsy and Buddy are sitting there. Maybe George Clinton was hanging out then. I know Bernie Worrell was around because Bernie was playing on the album. And uh, different cats were coming around. Mudbone was around. Bernard Fowler, it's the first time I met Bernard Fowler. The legend Bernard Fowler, who I love so much, my fucking brother. Um, and we were sitting there listening to it. And I remember Buddy Miles goes, man, what's he playing back there? I can't quite figure out what's he, what's he playing. And Bootsy looks at him. And Bill Laswell looks at him and they go, Buddy, that's you playing drums. He goes, what? And he's like, it was Buddy playing drums. Buddy came in on the session one day and he sat down on the drums and they did good to your ear hole. And Buddy didn't even remember doing it. So there you go. You know, these things that would happen on a Funkadelic session. It was Buddy. And Buddy was listening going, what the hell is that guy playing? I can't figure that shit out. And it was actually Buddy Miles playing drums. So when you talk about random musicians on a Funkadelic record, I mean, I know I'm on a bunch of Funkadelic or George Clinton stuff that I that I see out, like hooray for the, our team and shit like that, that, that I'm not credited on. So you never know, like, you know, what goes around. Wow. <laughs> I remember, though, when this record hit, I was so excited about it, the, the um, Third Eye, because it was immediately, as soon as I heard it, it was like, wow, this is Band of Gypsies updated. And, uh, and just all of the three players, so amazing. Um, well, you just so you know, once we did Got a Feeling and it was like eight minutes long, we pretty much said, fuck the world. We're going to just jam. And I threw out all the songs I wrote, except maybe Shake It, which didn't work. I wanted to take it off the album, but, you know, it was like they kept it. I didn't like the way it came out. Shake It, the original version of Shake It was much more like this hip-hop funk thing. But the rest of the record, and we ended up redoing uh, Leakin', which we did on... We did leaking on uh, what's on the Bootsy's. What's, what was that album? What's Bootsy doing? What's Bootsy doing album? Yeah, we did leaking on that. I remember I cut that at United Sound in Detroit. But uh, so we did it again for this album because I always loved leaking was my jam. You know, um, if I'm leaking, I'm a blood brother. Blood is thicker than mud, ain't it? <laughs> I love that shit, man. Bootsy's so awesome. So we decided, fuck it. We're not going to make any hit singles, man. We're just going to fucking play eight-minute songs, seven-minute songs. And we're just going to say, fuck it. You know, Boots is on there. Oh, you know, he's doing all his shit. And uh, everything that he did, uh, Bootsy, we would try to create these platforms for Bootsy to do his, uh, oh, buddy, uh, all his shit. And we didn't do it because we wanted the song. We did it because we wanted to watch him do it. Because when you stand next to him when he does it, He'll be standing, and he makes his face kind of like Mr. Ed. He's like, oh, <laughs> and we would die laughing. I mean, it was like, it was just the best fucking time of my life. Uh, you know, New York City, 
had a ton of fucking money, you know, playing with the greatest musicians in the history of music. And it, it was an incredible experience. And, and I didn't have the pressure of trying to make a hit record. All we had to do was be cool. And, and it was for an artist... Those days are gone, I'm sure now, right? in a way. But uh, you can be cool, but then no one hears it, you know. Right? But uh, it was a, it was an incredible time. Wow. Um, and then you had mentioned, but rewind a couple of years earlier when you did do that Bootsy record. You know, how did you um, transition from what you were doing into that, and what were those sessions like? Well, originally, Bootsy started the album with Bill Laswell. I mean, Bill Laswell was such a huge part of my early career. I did so much shit with Laswell. But I hadn't met Laswell yet. Because Laswell did Color Code. And uh, Laswell executive produced Nickel Bag. And Laswell did all the you know, hardware. He did all this shit. Um, and Laswell started the Bootsy album for Jamie Cohen, Cohen at Columbia Records, who was one of my dear friends. Jamie Cohen was, was the head of A&R at Columbia Records. And he's how I met Don Was. We went to a meeting, me and Bootsy, because he signed Bootsy. And that's how I met Don Was. Um, I had been writing with Bootsy at four track demos and um, for trying to do get ready to do Bootsy's new album. And we were writing a lot and I was writing on a four track. And I, back then I was still broke. This was 1987 still, right? Early 87. I um, go to a meeting. Bootsy says, come with me. We're going to go to Columbia Records and have a meeting in L.A. with Jamie Cohen and uh, playing some of these demos we're writing. And he wants us to meet some cat called Don Was. I go, who is he? Because I don't know. I don't know who he is. Some guy, producer guy from England, we thought. Because um, I never heard of Was Not Was. I mean, I should have, but I didn't. I, was, I wasn't that educated as people think. You know, I just knew what, I, what, I, what fell in front of my face. And, and maybe my naivety, being stupid, is what helped me because I didn't come in and try to, like, give them what they needed. I just, who the fuck are you? I don't know. This is what I do. And they go, wow, that's cool. So it, me being an idiot helped me, I think. So I go and sit down with Don Was, and, and, and uh, they're talking about Don maybe producing some of the Bootsy album. And what ended up happening was we played some four-track shit, and then Don and all of us left, and then my phone rang that afternoon. It was Don Was, and he goes, man, some of that guitar you were playing on those four-track demos was killer. He goes, you, you think you might want to come down and play on our record? And I needed a job, so I'm like, hell yeah, I'll fucking play on anything if you're paying me. And um, I went to Don's house, and um, we start. They were working on the What Up Dog album, and I played. The first thing I did was play guitar on a song called Eleven Miles an Hour" that Sweet Pea was singing, and and it was about the drive by of John F. Kennedy's drive. And were, I guess they were going eleven miles an hour when he got assassinated, and um, and, and I liked it. And then he started playing me all this crazy shit, you know, like when Yaz turned blue and all this fucking nutty shit that Don and David were doing. And I thought it was funny. And Don kept calling me back. And uh, and during that time, Bootsy kind of went into a hiatus. I mean, Bootsy was doing weird shit back then. It was like, I remember Jamie, Jamie Cohen calling me saying, do you know what Bootsy did today? And I go, what? He goes, he took the rental car to the train station because back then Bootsy wouldn't fly. He was afraid of flying. He was flying one time. He told me on the on the um, SST, you know, the, the supersonic airplane they used to fly. I forget what they call it. And the engines all shut off. And he thought he was going to die, so he so he wouldn't fly anymore. The Concord, so he, yeah, Concord. And he would so he would only take the train. So I guess he was late for the training. He took the rent a car and left the engine running, left the keys in it, got out, left it parked illegally, and ran and caught his train. The car was there. Somehow Columbia Records got the phone call. This is the kind of shit that used to happen, right? You know, back in the good old days when record companies covered your ass. So Bootsy split for a while. I ended up doing Was Not Was. And then uh, Bootsy went back to Cincinnati. And after I did Was Not Was, I got a call from Bootsy to come to Detroit. And um, he was in United Sound now working on what's Bootsy doing. He originally, I'm sorry, I skipped something. He originally went to New York and started the record with Bill Laswell. And I wasn't invited. He wanted me to come, but Bill Laswell had a whole plan. And he had the great Eddie Martinez there playing, who I emulated a lot because of his work with Run DMC. So I was, and we both played Hammer guitars. So he had the superstar, you know, Eddie Martinez and all that this shit happened in New York. He took all those tracks. He didn't finish the album with, with Laswell. He went back, he called me. I went to United Sound and I spent two or three days. Me and Bootsy had a shared a condominium. 
and we'd sit at night and we'd just play guitars and come up with shit. Like he literally was like my big brother. So it was that comfortable where like, you know, he'd sit around. And, I mean, I ended up staying at his house before too. We, we worked at his house. I met his mom and the whole bit back when I was a kid. So he really, really took me under his wing. So we ended up doing, I remember we cut Leakin and we cut Electro Cuties and we cut like, uh, um, Rather Be With You, I think that was on there, a whole bunch of stuff. And then I just flew home and, and, then, and then all hell broke loose because then I joined Rod Stewart and my life went fucking bonkers. Well, Living With Boots, it's funny, I just recently interviewed, I don't know if you know Michael Lane, Microwave. Uh, Microwave. Yeah, he also... He was around when I was around. It was me, Microwave. He, I remember, he, you know, a microwave cooks from the inside out, right? So his big slogan was, Microwave, cooking from the inside out. I always remember that shit. Yeah, yeah. So, but Bootsy took him under his wing, too. It's like... It, it was me and him. He was... I never got to hang with him because he was always back in Cincinnati or Detroit or wherever it was, Indiana or something like that where he lived. And I was in L.A., but microwave, he talked about microwave all the time. Mm. I was more hanging out with Amp Fiddler because me and Amp were both, Amp started with P-Funk in 85 when I did. And so me and Amp Fiddler were always around and George was always in LA. So we were always around with, you know, the Tackhead thing and not, not Doug Wimbish and Bernard's Tackhead, but Jimmy G and Tackhead, you know, mm. you always break my heart, yeah. kicking it down, down, which I would rip off years later on my song, Kick Back. <laughs> Did, did you go out uh, and do any shows with George or, or Bootsy or any of that? I wanted to, but it just, it was, everything was a whirlwind. Think about this. A 85, a August 85, I was homeless. So 86 was like a writing, doing shit, cutting, getting shit happening. Um, 87, Was Not Was came out, and, and I put the band together for the, the videos for Walk the Dinosaur, Spine of House of Love. Um, I used me. Amp Fiddler on keyboards from, from P-Funk. Carla Azar was the drummer for Wendy and Lisa. And um, I had her playing percussion because she was a friend of mine. And she was one of my gang. You know, we were all like a gang in L.A. then. And uh, Winston Watson, who was the drummer of Color Code, played drums in the videos. And we put this cool band together. And then next thing you know, we had number one records. So we started flying to England all the time. And I was also going to England before that. Um, with a guy called Zio, who I met, how kind of I used as my intro to George Clinton. Zio was a Fairlight guy in LA. It was Thomas Dolby and Zio were these Fairlight guys, and Thomas was around. And um, Zio went to England, and he started calling me saying, Nobody plays guitar like you here. You need to come. So he started flying me to England, and that's where I met Terrence Trent Darby, who I would become Terrence's music director. There was all kinds of crazy shit going on. So we, I never was touring until I'd go to England, do Top of the Pops. Do all these huge TV shows with Was Not Was, the top of the pops like five times or something, which was in back home, there was no internet, right? In England, it was the big shit in the fucking world. It was like, you know, big. And, but back home, I was like, where you been? And I was like, you don't understand. I was hanging out with Banana Rama last night, and George Michaels. It's like, what? There's, there's, there's just no internet. So no one knew what you were doing, right? And uh, so I didn't tour until Rod Stewart called. That was my first big, that was my first tour other than my high school band. Wow. So you, Record first with George Clinton, and you tour first with Rod Stewart. That's something else. Yeah, yeah. I uh, and Rod's first three shows were football. First four shows were football stadiums, and so you talk about a guy who didn't, it was out of his element, man. I almost got fired every night. I was, I was fucking such an idiot, man. But it was so awesome. Uh, when you did the uh, P Funk stuff and Bootsy and all that, how much? To what extent did uh, George or or Bill Laswell or Bootsy or Gary uh, guide you in what to play versus you kind of coming up with what you thought worked? Never guided me ever, which is weird. But George would yell like, yeah, yeah, right there, right there, yeah, 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 you know, shit like that. And Gary never said shit. But what, what, what guided me with Gary was when I got to watch him play. He was the king, the fucking king of that funk shit. You, you know, this is the joke. Everyone calls me, I'm supposed to be this great funk guitar player. And I'm not trying to sound like I'm bragging, but everyone regards me. A lot of people will call me and they think I'm this funk, right? Those guys never let me play any funk on their records. If you really listen to what I was playing, it was almost all fucking solos and crazy shit. Those guys play funk on a whole nother level. And that's where I got the concept for Color Code. I said, I want to play funk like, 
what 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 Shider's doing and those guys doing, but with but with an, with a heavy tone, right? And that's how I came up with the concept of the color code because I needed to come up with something to make myself stand out in LA and be unique because I was never going to be as good as Eddie Van Halen, and I wasn't an '80s rock god guy. I didn't want to be that. I hated that kind of music. I mean, I liked some of it, I, you know, I, you know, but most of it I hated. I just thought it was so corny. But I wanted to play football stadiums and arenas, and playing in a in an R&B band wasn't going to get me. The playing in Was Not Was wasn't going to get me playing stadiums, man. I wanted to rock. I wanted a wall of martial amps behind me. So I had to come up with this whole concept. And you also had, and, and you worked with them with Blue Tim, assuming Bernie Worrell on your first record. Um, what was he like? Did you spend much time with Bernie? Yeah, I spent a lot of time with Bernie. Uh, Bernie, I love Bernie Worrell. Bernie came into the studio, I believe, no, I think I met Bernie. You know what? I did meet Bernie during funk, during Georgia State because Bernie and him were kind of on outs. Bernie wasn't playing uh, on that uh, George Clinton album. I don't believe. And maybe he did tracks before, but it was all Amp Fiddler because Amp kind of took Bernie's place, right? And Amp was really young then, right? It's funny because I was just doing a huge arena tour with uh, in Japan recently, and I and I brought Amp Fiddler as our keyboard player, so we we're still back together. You know, we we literally in, in the late '80s used to sleep. I used to sleep on a futon on the floor, and Amp would sleep on the floor with a blanket next, you know, right in the same house. You know, and here we, you know, we're still out a hundred years later playing playing sold out arenas. It was like so fun. But um, Bernie came in. On, on Color Code, I believe. I, I, that might have been the first time I met him. I just don't remember for sure. But he came in and he fucking, you know, he just was Bernie wore out. He came into the, I think we, Bernie, we were cutting at Sorcerer Sound in New York City. And I remember Bernie came in and, and uh, Vanity, from Vanity 6. Remember Vanity? Yeah, Vanity, Denise, Denise Van Matthews. Yeah. She came in and fucked the whole session up because she had these skin tight pants on and my drummer Winston Watson Jr. She's like hi Winston and her ass was just like <clears throat> and he couldn't play. He got all geeked up and he was couldn't play. It was just she like was rubbing his hair and he he just fucking lost his marbles. And and cause she came down to say hi to Bernie and the whole session was canceled. Like we did no good the fucking waste of a night. Nothing happened that night. But that was the first time when Bernie came in, Vanity came in to see Bernie. <laughs> wow, all those years after she turned Prince's head, she was still messing people up. Well, this was only 1989. Yeah. Wasn't that, you know, after what was Vanity 6, 86 or something? It was earlier than that, but yeah. Because she dropped out before Purple Rain, that was 84. Oh, there you go. There you go. Well, she still was booming. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, that first record uh, was smoking, the color code. And. Um, you almost instantly, it seemed to me, you got a lot of um, um, popularity in Japan. Is that correct? Well, what happened was um, I got the biggest, in 1988, while I was on the Rod Stewart tour, I was showcasing before I joined Rod. And um, I got the Rod gig, and there was no way I was not going to do that gig. Rod Stewart in 88 was a superstar rock star. It was like, you know, Marshall Stacks and... And, and Carmine Rojas, it was David Bowie's guys, it was Carmine Rojas on bass, whose poster was on my wall at my mom and dad's house still. You know, it was like everybody in my, my dream. You know, Carmine played bass on Let's Dance, you know what I mean? It was like, Tony Thompson was the original drummer from Chic, and it was just like playing with him was just like, wow. And then Tony Brock came in, who was in The Babies, who I loved when I was in school too. I loved The Babies, I saw him in concert many times. So I was no way I wasn't gonna do that gig. And um, it was, you know, five nights at Madison Square Gardens, and, three nights at the LA Forum, everything sold out, private airplane, oh, it was ridiculous. And, um, I, and then in the middle of it, I get this gigantic recording contract with Island Records. And I had to keep it a secret because I didn't want Rod to find out and, and, and get upset with me because I was always almost getting fired every week and I didn't want to give him another reason to fire me. You know, I mean, it's the first time I was making, now I was fucking rich. I was making like crazy money. It, I mean, it, my whole life changed, you know what I mean? It was like, it was like rock star shit. You know, big money, giant recording contract, biggest recording contract Island ever gave a new artist, actually. A uh, um, big publishing deal. I mean, I was loaded. I mean, all of a sudden, I was like from zero to a thousand, you know what I mean? Like, just like miles per hour. And um, 
I do call it, I go, go do Island Records. My manager by then was Bill Graham. And my day-to-day -day guy was a really amazing guy. He was like a big brother to me, Morty Wiggins. Went on to run AM Records. And so Morty said, I don't think you should sign with Island because they have a lot of issues with money and problems. And, and um, But I wanted to work with this guy, Steve Pross, who was my A&R guy, who really believed in me. So I signed with Island. And it was a pretty good contract, a lot of dough. Um, but... When I started the album, they expected you to be outside, so it was cool. They loved the idea of Bill Lazo. I originally wanted to go to Australia and work with Nick Launay because I loved that work he'd done with NXS and in Midnight Oil. And um, and I'd speaking to Nick down in Australia, and the record company's like, "We're not sending you to fucking Australia for three months on your own with no supervision. It's like you'll never come back." And they're right, right? So I went to New York and did it with Lazo. Album is getting. Pre-press is through the roof. I mean, maybe because of my association with Funkadelic and George and Bootsy and, and Bernie and Laswell, um, I was the critic's darling. I was the critic's... And I did this album called Red Warrior with Ronald Sean Jackson, which I didn't even know what the hell I was doing. But everyone said, oh, God, it's a genius. And I fucking got... Still to this day, I have no, not a clue what I was playing. Lost the whole time. But, you know, I wasn't going to say that. Then I was like, hey, they call me a genius. I'm just let it go. Because I have fucking no clue what I just did there. I have no idea. So um, the, pr the critics just love me. Album comes out critically acclaimed pretty much everywhere. Even in, like, hard rock magazines. Like, like Kerrang! It was five, five Ks and all this shit. People are like, wow. Um, so Bill, Bill uh, Graham managed Joe Satriani. And, and um, we're going to put you on a Joe Satriani tour. And I'd opened up a couple Satriani show, shows while I was showcasing before I got signed and before Rod Stewart. And so I, 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 I kind of knew Joe. And Joe did Jagger. And ironically, I would end up doing Jagger after. You know? And um, I go on this tour with, with Joe Satriani. And it was fucking, I hated it. I loved it because I loved Joe. And the, what he was, they were doing was amazing. But every night, I went from this arena tour with Rod Stewart with 20,000 people and, and supermodels and movie stars and like to Joe Satriani, 5,000 people every night sold out. 4,995 of them were guys. Okay? Guitar geeks, and yeah. all of them just stood there and <laughs> stared at your fingers. And I remember like we playing and some guy would be like, that's crap. All he's doing is playing pentatonics. And I'm like, what's a pentatonic? I don't I never took a lesson. So I remember I, I, I called Rusty Anderson, who you know, plays with Paul McCartney now, but Rusty was, was the guitarist for my songwriting partner, Parthenon Huxley. I go, what's a pentatonic? He goes, well, it's the kind of style you play. It's kind of a blues-based style. And I'm like, okay. I, Rusty Anderson had to tell me what a pentatonic was. And uh, so every night I'd get a standing ovation on Satriani Stewart. Every night. And I was playing this fucking funk, you know. Yeah, could you get I was really doing it up. That was my, that, that was my ace in the hole because I was doing exactly – it was heavy. It was like Hendrix, but it was like funk. It had high energy and it rocked because my band was really like almost a bit of a punk rock edge. And uh, it wasn't what Satriani was doing, but my solos could were short and short bursts, a la Steve Stevens, who I idolized from Billy Idol or something, you know. And uh, every night I got a standing ovation, and I would I was getting to be really famous now as a guitar player. I, I got into Reader's Poll that year. As a, Voted in America, third best guitar player in the world, um, in, in Guitar Player Magazine, best new guitarist or something like that, you know. And uh, but there was no records in the stores. So back then they had record stores. I know you know about record stores, but a lot of young people don't know what record stores are. They had record stores, right? Well, what happened was Island Records was getting ready to be bought by po by by Polygram, and they were distributed by Warner Brothers. So three months into my tour. Warner Brothers says we're losing this record, so we're not going to distribute it anymore because we can't make any money on it. Polygram was like, we can't wait to get your record, but we can't touch it. So I literally lost my distribution during that Satriani tour. I really had no distribution. Warner Brothers kind of dropped the ball on me, and Polygram couldn't pick up the ball yet. So I was in a really bad position. I'm playing sold out shows every night, and then my song, The Heart of the Comes, doing okay at radio. But I was distributed by Sony, by BM, not Sony BMG, it was just BMG back then. It was uh, RCA BMG. I was distributed by them in in uh, in, uh, in Europe, 
and he and so I was powering out in Europe, and I was distributed by Polygram in Japan, and I was crushing in Japan. So I think I would have crushed in America if I could have had my distribution on properly. So I, I just I just failed miserably in America, and went on to Europe where I did really well, and went on to Japan, which I did incredibly well. Japan was just like. I, I could I could I put a soul show for sale and it was sell out in five minutes, and luckily for me today that's still happening. Thank God. Uh, and so I was Japan, Europe ended up becoming my base because I just never recovered in America. I never recovered. I mean, I would do cool shit in America, you know, Terrence and Darby on tour, Duran Duran, and all these amazing records and that stuff I'd play on and produce and where. But as a solo artist, America was lost to me forever, and it never came back to me. Wow, that is really interesting. There were so many changes in the industry business-wise during that time. It was pretty turbulent. and um, But also at that time, I mean, Japan and Europe, I know to a lesser extent, but was seemed to be really embracing uh, American music that was sort of like 20 years prior. So I know like all of the Parliament Funkadelic stuff was coming out first reissued through Japan and some of the great jazz stuff and so much of the great funk stuff and they seemed like they were really deep into it much more so in the US was kind of like losing it you know I used to explain to people that in Europe in Japan they love an artist they don't buy the song they do too sometimes of course but in America it was all about what song was on the radio or what song was on MTV it was the song and often in America um, you would buy that song, you read, the artist put out another record and you didn't, like when I was a kid at the record store, I remember trying to get, you know, the new Led Zeppelin album, the new Cars album. I was hearing just what I needed nonstop and I had to have that record. And I'd go to the record store every day looking for that record. You know, I was loyal to an artist so when the second Cars album came out, I was there ready to buy it. I didn't even know if they, I, any songs were good or not. I was loyal. To an artist. And in Europe and Japan, they're they're loyal to the artist, not necessarily the song. And so, an artist can have a career that Funkadelic can come in and play, play, play. The Ventures could play there for three months, playing those songs and those uh, those records they loved, you know, because they were in the act. In America, they kind of lost that. Yeah, it's a damn shame, but uh, unfortunate. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.